Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next uh, Avatar in review video. This one's going to be episode 2 for Avatar The Last Airbender, book 2 Earth. So um, I did book 1 Water last time round, and I'm going to be doing book 3 Fire next time round before um, Avatar as a whole, and then getting into Korra. But um, for this week, we're going to focus on uh, book 2 Earth, as I said, this is obviously the DVD box standard stuff and uh, yeah book to earth overall I would say is the most consistently good of all of the books of uh, Avatar at the very least um, in terms of there's no like dud episode in book two there are some episodes that are better than others and so on but overall this is an extremely consistent book because it's very well written a lot of the kind of layers of plot that come into the show come in in this book and I would definitely go as far to say is that um, while book one is good and definitely gets you into Avatar The Last Airbender I think it's book two earth that really kind of solidifies this as like this is a really good show and then book two book three kind of completes the kind of trilogy and makes this a great show that everyone remembers and is extremely memorable but uh, this this book is extremely important uh, for all of that to happen because it puts a lot of things in place that book three is then able to kind of complete effectively but um yeah overall you know really consistent and um, what it maybe lacks is some of the extremely like epic high quality episodes that maybe some of the other books have but it is super consistent and still has good episodes of its own it's just kind of lacking that um invasion uh, kind of arc of episodes it's lacking you know the Sozin's Comet finale kind of esque episodes it's lacking the Siege of the North type episodes um, but it's got good episodes of its own the finale of book two is good in its own way and so on but um, yeah let, let's get into some talking points actually before I get into just talking about episodes um, I think Zuko's arc in this book is definitely one of the biggest strengths of book two because Zuko goes through so much in this book and oftentimes like it, it's kind of the one of the more difficult kind of uh, arcs in the show to just really just pinpoint in like a sentence what his arc is in this book because so often he is the side plot of like nearly every episode in the book and it's really only like Zuko alone where he like basically has the episode to himself but um, still it's such an interesting arc because obviously it starts off with the aftermath from book one where um, effectively they're branded traitors by the Fire Lord. He sent Azula out to capture the two of them. And so they're on the run from the royal family basically. And they have a great scene to show that when the two of them cut off their, you know, top knot signifying they're kind of part of the royal family. And they just get rid of that straight away because they are fugitives now. They can't wear that or they'll be easily be identified and so they're on the run and what them being on the run allows them to do it means that Zuko can't hunt Aang and it means <clears throat> he's given a chance to basically act like a normal person to kind of stay undercover and so Iroh kind of throughout this whole book is trying to help Zuko and guide him uh, and he's basically just opening this opportunity for Zuko that you don't have to go through with this destiny that you think is yours, given to you by your father, that you have to capture the Avatar, restore your honor, get, basically get your place back by his side. And instead, something that's just as valid that you can do is easily just decide that you want to settle down in one of these towns that we visit and, you know, kind of start a family of your own, that sort of thing. Live a simple life that you'll be happy in rather than trying to destroying yourself trying to make this destiny that you think is yours happen and so you kind of deal with Zuko kind of struggling between he thinks he kind of has to go back to that uh, his old kind of destiny back from book one uh, between thinking that maybe he does still have a big destiny but it's not that thing with Ozai that he still has something big that he's meant to do and then just almost accepting the fact that Maybe it would be best if I just started in a normal life. And you really see him experience so much as they visit these little towns. Like um, they visit that um, girl Song who was burned because of you know Fire Nation, and they just go through the Earth Kingdom and basically experience basically what the Fire Nation has done because of the war they've started. <coughs> um, and so 
you know, they, they experience what they've, uh, what the Fire Nation has done because of the war. And you really see him make these connections and it's so important because obviously this, does, this sort of stuff comes up later when he actually talks to Ozai in book three in that he has all of this experience of being on the other side of the war and knows that all the Fire Nation history books have it all wrong, that the Fire Nation is the aggressors. They're just trying to power-hungry capture the whole world, basically. And so Zuko has such a good perspective on it because of his the advice that Iroh gives him and because of having such an experience traveling the world, in, in traveling the Earth Kingdom during wartime. And you just have all these various uh, experiences that he has. Like um, Even like the, the Tales of Bossing say, the tale of Zuko, you have him just go on a date with this Earth Kingdom girl called uh, Jin, and, you know, he he doesn't want to enjoy it, and so he kind of, like, is acting like his usual self, but he gradually just gets to the point where he does enjoy the date, and is almost conflicted as to what he should do. Like, he's like, he, he obviously says to his uncle and I, so, you know, it, it was nice, and then he just kind of goes away, because he's kind of thinking about what it would kind of mean if he were to just kind of, like, start a relationship with this girl and just avoid everything else obviously you know he he then kind of <clears throat> comes in contact with Aang uh, has the opportunity to kind of capture Aang through kind of like um, capturing Appa and kind of finding him in, in the Daily headquarters um, and for the first time in the series we see Iroh just get angry at Zuko that He's been kind of carefully kind of guiding him, just giving a little bit of advice, but always letting Zuko make the mistakes if he does make them. But this time he just gets angry at Zuko and said, like, what do you want from your life, you know, and sort of stuff like that. And it really kind of just helps Zuko kind of get rid of this whole blue spirit personality, which is the thing in this book that is always drawing him, drawing him back to the kind of character he was in book one and the whole capture the avatar mentality. And him throwing that away is very symbolic. And then, obviously, he kind of gets in contact with Azula, you know, as the finale comes around. And you're really wondering, what side is he going to choose? Because you have such an interesting dynamic over the whole book of the fact that Zuko has these two people who are the key influences in his life at this point. And they are, obviously, Iroh for good and Azula kind of for bad, basically. And you just kind of are hoping so much that he sides with his uncle because his uncle cares for him so much and Azula only cares about succeeding with her mission and stuff like that. So really interesting stuff with that. And then obviously the, the Zuko story means that you have to have Azula involved. And you, they, that brings up the whole point, another huge plus about this book, so many good new, new characters introduced in this book. Azula, May, Tylee, Toph are like the key ones, but mainly it's, it's Azula and Toph, I'd say, because May and Tylee, while you get some focus on them, they're kind of just part of Azula's team. Uh, they get their kind of bigger moments towards like book three, um, but um, Azula and Toph are definitely key characters. Azula, far and away, the best villain in Avatar, because Zhao is, works for book one, he plays his role perfectly for book one as this kind of bad guy to show that Zuko is not the bad guy basically um and Ozai works as just this very threatening just big bad of the series that our heroes have to take down in the end and Zuko also has a reason to want to either you know take him down or join him it's it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic just created by Ozai but he himself is not a great character because we don't really know a lot about him apart from he's powerful he's the fire lord um and stuff like that so Azula ends up being the most interesting villain we have in the show because, you know, she's obviously Zuko's sister. She's Ozai's daughter. And she is just so threatening on screen constantly. She's so controlling, manipulative, and she just works, you know, she has that way of handling people that just scares them and makes them join her. And that, that's seen perfectly and obviously how she takes over the... Earth Kingdom towards the end of the book with uh, her taking over Ba Sing Se from the inside and getting the Dai Li on her side. But it's, all, it's just as well shown in like the first scene she has in the book basically with the guy, you know, to do the tides command the ship, that whole uh, sequence. Really well done uh, with, with the way her character progresses and you really see the constant contrast between the two siblings, Zuko and Azula, in that, you know, 
Zuko obviously ends up being the one who was raised primarily by his mother, while Azula was primarily raised by her father. And so the two siblings rarely had a lot of influence from their other parent, basically, because of the whole dynamic in that thing of Azula being the firebending prodigy, Zuko not being great uh, at firebending when he was younger. And so Ozai chose, basically, Azula over him. Um, <clears throat> you also have to add in a little bit of the fact that... Um, Ozai was also a second born and you know Iroh was the one given all the birthrights and he basically through <coughs> capitalizing on like Iroh's losses basically took uh, power and stuff like that so you, you maybe add a little factor of that that he, pre he that he preferred his second born just by default but yeah you know, either way Azul is the more powerful one and you just see the kind of difference in the two of them in that Zuko despite the kind of persona he sometimes gives across really cares about the people that he does come into contact with that he ha does actually have like a really good heart and you cl that's clear that clearly comes from his mother um and that you know he would make a good fire lord if he was given the chance while azula is much more kind of powerful prodigal at uh, firebending but and she's like super controlling powerful and stuff like that but what she lacks is the kind of people skills that Zuko kind of has, that she doesn't really care so much for the people around her. Even her friends, Mei and Tai Lee, she kind of uses them more as soldiers than actual friends and kind of ends up kind of manipulating them as her friends, even though, like, they actually would follow her just if they have that friendship relationship. And it's just a it's really interesting one in that Azula just can't act normally with people. She, she, the, the only way that she thinks she can get people on her side is by making them fear her or, you know, just manipulating them to join her. And it's such an interesting dynamic that goes on, but um, that's Azula. Toph um, is our kind of hero new character, I suppose, and um, she adds a lot to the group. Um, th th there's a slight problem with her, her character, obviously, and... It, I understand she's one of the most popular characters in the show. That's really clear to see that she is top three far and away. I personally don't see that primarily because her character arc doesn't really get resolved in the show and it was only really resolved in the Rift comics very recently. And that being that obviously the episode she's introduced in is the Blind Bandit. And this presents all of these issues about, you know, her parents um, not seeing her the way she actually is. And even though she proves to them at the end of the episode that she's a powerful earthbender, more so than nearly anyone in the world, they still just treat her as their blind daughter and think that she's helpless and just needs to be protected. And it creates this whole dynamic that she runs away from her parents. She doesn't actually tell them that she's leaving. And it creates the whole uh, Zinfu, Master Yu chasing after Team Avatar thing. So that's uh, Toph's main character arc in the show, that over time she should have to prove herself to her family. Um, and that doesn't get resolved in the entire show. And now it's not a specific problem with book two, obviously, which I'm covering in this video, but it ends up being a problem, a little bit of a problem with book two, just because it's where it's presented. Uh, I'll talk about this more in the Avatar overall video, but it's just something I wanted to bring up that... I don't think Toph has the most amazing character journey throughout the show. I think her character, as it's presented to us, is done. Like, look, insanely powerful Earthbender. No one can beat her in battle. You know, the problem is that she doesn't really have many flaws, I suppose. She has these kind of issues with some of the people on her team and stuff like that. And they bring up the parent thing from time to time. But the fact that it's not resolved is a little bit of an issue, I think, with her character in that. Um, she's definitely such a... I get why she's so popular because she's so awesome on screen all the time but the reason all the other characters are not so awesome all the time is because they have these kind of interesting character arcs and flaws and stuff like that even though they are really powerful um, so yeah I, I like that um, Toph is interesting that she does add that much needed like just really powerful bender to the group she adds um, an interesting dynamic just with how does this team that's been together for like a whole season interact with someone new joining up? Um, it, it's, it's a cool dynamic for sure. And just the fact that she is blind and that she does use earthbending to see is, is, a, is a really cool idea to kind of show a disabled character in the show. And, you know, to the point where they can, they actually, they actively make jokes about her blindness because characters just forget that she's blind because she's so capable and there's only like some very specific uh things that come up when she actually 
is a blind person, that she can't actually see this blight or earthbending. And so, you know, it's kind of like, oh, there's so often in the show that you actually just forget that she is blind, uh, and a lot of the characters do that as well. So that says a lot about her character, that they make the kind of blind character the most powerful earthbender. It, 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 it is really well done, but um, she's definitely a bit lacking in just a, an emotional character arc of the whole book. And it ends up that her book two arc, for instance, is basically she learns metal bending and gains friends, which is, is fine early on, but primarily her arc of the whole show is just that she gains, she becomes more powerful, and metal bending is a pretty cool thing, nonetheless. Um, another character arc before getting to episodes, um, Aang and the Avatar state, and slash earthbending, I suppose. What, what the main goal of the book, I suppose, is that Aang has learned waterbending, he's now going to learn earthbending, he has to find a master, he encounters a vision in the swamp of basically this little girl, turns out to be tough. Boomy in an earlier episode had told him that uh, he needed a master who could be patient and, you know, waits and listens before striking, and that's tough kind of through and through pretty much. Um, but the the whole earthbending thing is, uh, you know, it's, it's basically resolved in one episode, bitter work, and it's well done, definitely, um, and really shows, I suppose, part of the issue that I had with book one and that Aang just learned waterbending like that, like it wasn't an issue, like the whole book led up to Katara and Aang have to learn waterbending, Aang just learns it off screen basically, um, uh, I have a little bit of an issue with that, I, I think they should have made it more of a kind of um, struggle for him and actually create a character development moment from it, but they do it well with earthbending in that they basically just establish that Aang's personality is the complete opposite of earthbending. He likes to avoid and evade things, not just in battle, but um, conflicts that happen, I suppose, and stuff like that. And he can't really... He struggles to just deal with stuff head-on, you know, like a problem, deal with it head-on. And so Toph is basically just asking him to do the thing that he's so unused to. And it's, it's an important thing for him to learn, I suppose, as the Avatar, to actually face problems head on and so it ends up not just being an important lesson for earthbending but for him personally as well and the way it's done is really interesting just with Toph using the fact that she's a lot more forceful uh, in her personality than he is and just kind of stepping over him all of the time and just kind of like uh, asking him to basically stand up to her like confront her head on about the kind of stuff that she's made doing and it, it takes Sokka being in danger with the whole Fufu Cuddly Poop storyline to act, actually make him stand up to this wild animal and then stand up to Toph. And after that, he can learn earthbending. It, it's simple, but really effective. Um, so I like that. There, there's no need for like tens of episodes focusing on him uh, struggling with this technique and then a moment where he gets it. It's just one episode, well done. Um, and then you go to the Avatar state story with Aang, which is his main emotional arc over the whole book, and that's obviously presented in the first episode, the Avatar state, um, when obviously Katara is nearly killed by the Earth Kingdom general, and Aang goes into the Avatar state. And he's been having these dreams about what happened uh, in the finale of book one with the whole Koizilla situation, where he did that he destroyed the army, he did all this stuff, and he had no idea that he was doing it, he had no control, and that's a big thing with him, this book, is that he's afraid to go into the Avatar state in case he hurts the people around him and stuff like that, and so straight away Avatar state is presented to him that you are right to sort of be afraid of this thing, but at the same time you do have to be confident in using it, and that if you die in the Avatar state, the Avatar cycle ends forever. We learn a lot more about the Avatar cycle and how it specifically works in the beginnings, but for now, like it makes sense that, like what's happening here, um, just with what Roku says, and that, you know, the Avatar state ends if you're killed in the Avatar state, and so it leads to Aang having to also learn the Avatar state. This book, and that doesn't really happen until like the last couple of episodes. It, it's kind of forgotten about almost for a lot of the book, but you have moments where it's touched upon, and it just touches upon. Ang's various kind of character issues over the course of the whole book, um, but in the Guru, he's trying to learn it, and he he, op he gradually opens up all of these emotional chakras as he goes along. Um, but ultimately, when it comes to the last chakra, um, he struggles with it because it's asking him to basically, you know, let go of everything he cares about and people he loves, and for him, it's him letting go of Katara when. For the first time ever, he admits that he loves her, and so it's a 
it's an emotional kind of challenge for him and it's something that he his character can't accept that sure he gains all this power from doing this thing but he doesn't want to do it and um, in many ways it's kind of like a key un- a misunderstanding for Aang in that he's not being told to just let go of them forever right now and forever it's just the you know if the time comes when the world it's the world versus one person you have to as the avatar choose the world and I think Aang over, over time realizes that and so that that's obviously what his mindset is when he actually tries to unlock that final chakra in the cave in the last episode and it leads to him nearly being killed in the avatar state like the, the, the what actually happens is that he's like seconds basically away from activating it and he's killed while it's activating so the avatar state you know gets damaged but doesn't get like destroyed as roku says and so the escape from the spirit world comics that actually happened in between book two and three uh, just explain that yeah it was damaged Aang has to reconnect with his past lives in the spirit world uh, and reconnect with the avatar state so when he physically heals he will be able to use the avatar state again so that adds a lot to that situation um, but otherwise um, across the rest of the book you have Aang dealing with this stuff like loss and stuff like in the desert when he goes into the avatar state um, it's a really powerful moment because it's basically the first time in the middle of the book where he lets his emotions get the better of him and he nearly hurts the people around him. And once again, it shows Aang's character flaw. He cares too much about the people he loves and things he loves, uh, Appa and stuff and so on in this situation. And that's such a powerful moment, the desert. Um, it's definitely one of my personal favorite episodes. I- I'd never probably say it's like, the one of the top five episodes but for me it is top five personally because that moment at the end when Aang is in the avatar state and then Katara comes up to him and kind of pulls him down it's so powerful because of just the look on her face the emotion from Aang and just how the episode ends which is Aang in tears over the loss of Appa it's really emotional and I'd definitely say it's the most emotional uh, scene in all of Avatar for me anyway I think it's that big of a moment in that episode. But overall, Aang has an interesting journey for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll get into more of the, some of the more episodes now. I think I've covered most of the main kind of plots as such. Um, so yeah, um, you know, you, you have episodes like early on, like the Cave of Two Lovers, which is, is definitely not the best episode of the book, but it, it's fun because you meet Chong the Nomad. You you also get some interesting kind of backstory lore history type stuff with them. Um, finding out about Oma and Shu, the first human earthbenders, they learn from the badger moles. That's really important stuff. Plus, set more set up for uh, Katara and Ang's relationship and the fact that, you know, did they kiss, did they not kiss? I think most people probably agree right now that they did kiss, just because they both kind of blush at the end. Um, and so on. So that's a fun episode. You then have like episodes later on, like The Swamp, which, again, not the absolute best episode of the show but it's so interesting because of, of the mysteries it's such a spiritual episode of the of the show and very important they're just presenting this idea that like everything's connected that everyone in this world like acts like they're not connected but they're all everyone's the same species here we're all human and they're separated by these national divides and you know as the avatar you kind of represent the fact that everything is together and that should be the way things are so that's a cool thing that Aang learns over time um, and it really helps him with opening one of the chakras later on uh, because the idea of like separation is an illusion because of that um, and so on. So that's a, some interesting kind of philosoph- philosophical things that you learn in uh, this book. Um, then as you go on, you, you know, Blind Bandit, great episode, the introduction of Toph and that's just so well done with all the earth bending stuff, earth rumble. Uh, plus all the interactions with Toph and Aang and really get her character across in that episode. It's, it's really well done. Um, what else? Avatar, Avatar Day, you know, again, is, is kind of like the Cave of Two Lovers. It's kind of like a little bit of a silly episode for the most part, but it also has this really interesting lore aspect to it in that you get the full story on Chin and uh, Kyoshi and what happened there, the trial, the rough rhinos are in it. it it's a fun episode, though not the best. What... Where the book really becomes good 
is definitely after Aang's learned earthbending, you transition into episodes like the library, the desert, and then the bossing say arc with uh, the serpent's past, the drill, a city of laws and secrets like Lao Gai and so on, where the real plot of Avatar comes into play. That they find out that there is a way to take down the Fire Nation, that an eclipse will leave the Fire Nation without their bending until the eclipse is over. And so they they basically plan an attack for during the eclipse, which is going to happen before the comet comes and the end of the war and so on. Uh, and so this is their big hope that like in the middle of this book, the middle of the series basically, they finally find a way to defeat the Fire Nation. They just have to get to the Earth King who is in control of the most powerful remaining army, allied army in the world, and they can plan an attack and take them down. It's such a hopeful moment, but that episode, the way it ends with the Oppa being kidnapped, is just so tragic because you know Aang is going to basically be so distraught about this that it'll temporarily sidetrack the story because of that, because that's how much he cares. And... You know, you have you have some of the spirituality of Avatar come back in in that episode as well with the the Wan Shi Tung and the foxes and uh, Professor uh, Zay and so on. They're really interesting characters. But uh, coming back to the desert again, which is obviously the episode immediately after Oppa's kidnapped. Even beyond just that final scene, which I think is amazing, I think it's a really good episode overall because it's. It, on the outside, it seems like such a simple idea for an episode. Just, um, just our main characters lost in the desert. They have to get out. They're basically lost in the middle of a desert. How do they get out? And what I like about it is that they do an interesting thing. And it's, done, it's not like this teamwork thing to get out. Everyone except Katara gets basically taken out of the, taken out of being helpful. In that, Sokka drinks cactus juice early on. Can't be helpful. Toph has yet to learn sandbending, so she can't see very well in the desert, so she has to be kind of guided along, so she's not going to be much help. Um, Aang is so distraught over what's happened with Appa that he's not going to be much of help with leading and stuff like that because he's so angry and hurt over what's just happened. So it's left for Katara to take the lead of the group and really just bring them together and get them out of the desert. It's such a strong episode for Katara the desert. Really one of the best for her. So I really like that episode. And that leads directly into the Serpent's Pass where Aang has kind of got over being angry and he's kind of just not emotional about it at all. And he's kind of lost his hope. And for Katar, who's all about hope, that's like the worst thing to ever happen. And they have that emotional talk and eventually Aang becomes hopeful again because of the birth of the uh, new baby Hope. And that's just really well done that rolls directly into the drill the attack on bossing say that's a nice action-packed episode though again a bit problematic in that like it shouldn't have been as big of a problem as it was just because like the earth king the problem i have with that episode is that the earth kingdom send like what 10 soldiers out to take on the drill and then after that it's just left up to team avatar to deal with this thing like it's like the Earth Kingdom, did he, the bossing say not, not have like an army or anything like that? Like, I get that this thing is invulnerable, basically, but send a squadron of, um, like, troops out, like a hundred troops to take on this thing, and they'll do something to it, like, tip it over or something like that. Um, it just, like, f for this being the last main city left on the planet that's not under Fire Nation control, basically... Why was it left up to Team Avatar to do everything here? Although otherwise it's a perfectly good episode and um, the way they cleverly go inside and stuff like that, but it's a bit of a problem. The Bossing Say episodes, you know, basically City of Walls and Secrets, uh, Lake Lao Gai, are excellent. You know, they, they are really well written with the whole conspiracy plot, Long Feng coming into things, Azula starting to come into play a little bit more as well. All the time in the background you have the... Um, like Zuko and Jet doing some stuff, Jet getting captured by the Dai Li, the whole um, the kind of a hypnotizing basically thing that the Dai Li do. Um, really creepy episodes, but really well done. Lacking a little bit maybe in the like really hardcore epic action, but they're so well written that they're really good episodes. Um, the only problem I, su I suppose with the big problem I've said with the season comes in in that these two episodes are basically part one, part two, um, like uh, episode 14, City of Walls and Seekers, episode 17, uh, Lake Laogai. 
but there's two episodes in the middle that break up those two. And it makes sense, you know, they're put in a position where they can't really do anything by Long Feng because he's using Appa against them. And it makes sense that they have a break here, but it's such a risk that in a book that's otherwise so well done, that you have two of the most experimental episodes in the entire show's run. Um, the Tales of Bossing Say, which is just kind of like six mini stories told, you know, and they're all kind of seem a little bit fillery, but they kind of make sense. It's just kind of slice of life in Bossing Say. And then on the other side of things, episode 16, Oppa's Lost Days, is kind of like a flashback episode focusing completely on Oppa as what he's been doing since he was captured. That's like interesting. But to have those two episodes happen in the middle of what's probably your best written arc of the entire show is a little bit of a problem, I think, for a book that's overall so consistent and well-written. Definitely, I, I could have seen a, a way where you could have had it, like, 14... Yeah, like, 14, 15, yeah, like, do City of Balls and Secrets, Tales of Bossing, say, Lake Loud Guy, and maybe then uh, Oppa's Lost Days or something like that. Uh, just the the break between those two episodes is a bit is a bit much in my opinion. They're really good episodes, like they're not bad episodes, but um, they're so so different in format that it kind of takes a takes you away a little bit from some of the most well written parts of the show. And then you're getting into the finale. Like Zuko has such a great moment in the Earth King where he just gets he gets sick because of this kind of choice he makes that goes so far against what he's usually like. Uh, that's such an interesting concept, and then has to have this inner battle between does he side with uh, Iroh's dragon or Azula's dragon, which one has a better influence on him, and so on. Um, and all this crazy stuff is just starting to happen. Like, Suki is captured by Azula, Mei, and Tai Li. Um, they're going undercover uh, into Bossing Sei as Kyoshi warriors because they've captured everyone. Um, Suddenly the group is being separated because of all these letters that they've got. Sokka's going to see his father. Aang's going to the Guru. Katara's going to stay behind plan the invasion. Toph's going to try and make amends with her parents. And you're just kind of like, no. Like, there's there's something coming. You guys have to be together to stop this. And it, it's, it's, it, it leads up to just this dread moment of just like, when like, Katara's captured. When Toph is captured. And the other two are not sure what's going on. And... And, uh, yeah, it's just, like, the guru again. Like, come back to that one. One of, the, probably the best single character exploration episodes I've ever seen in any show, ever. Like, just how heavily they focus on what Aang, Aang's emotions in this episode are perfect. It's a perfect way to bring in his adventures so far, in that all of these little moments he's doing as he deals with all of these chakra. Uh, and... It's just so well done. I, I don't have the words to describe how well explored Aang's character is in this episode. And it just sets up that he's he's going to put his kind of love of Katara above gaining all power, which Iroh in the finale kind of, I suppose, praises him a little bit for that. You know, like, power is overrated. You know, you putting kind of love ahead of that is good. So I like that. And then the, f the final episode is just this... Um, it's not really like an epic episode, it's just this dark, you know, it's, it's well written, definitely, there's a lot of great moments in it, It's uh, there's some great action, but it's just defeat for our heroes, and it's just tragic as everything's happening, like Aang is killed in this episode, he's revived a couple of minutes later, but um, he's actually killed in this episode, Zuko makes the wrong decision, the decision that no one wants him to make, because Zuko's a fan favourite character, and for him to make this decision that no one wants him to was a huge moment in the fandom. Like, everyone, once they hated Zuko, but just were so sad that he made that decision. Uh, and especially the way, what he did to Iroh in doing that. Um, Azula, you hate her for killing Aang and what's happened. Um, just a ton of emotion in the f final scene because Zuko making that decision also betrays the little bit of trust that Katara had started to give to him in that great scene that the two have together where they kind of bond over the fact that their mothers, they have, uh, they basically lost their mothers in different ways, I suppose, um, and so on. And just the way that the book ends with just, you know, the Earth Kingdom has fallen and they're just flying away, that like, how are they going to win the war from here? That it's basically this small group and a couple of warriors scattered around the world against the whole Fire Nation army. 
it's an insane way to end the book, but it's really well done because your our heroes are in a tough position and they're going to have to rebuild, come up with a new plan and strike again. It, it, it's it's an excellent book. There's no it's really well done. Like there's no major problems as I said with this book. Maybe a little bit with just like that uh, episode 15 and 16 have have to come right two episodes with completely experimental format in the middle of one of the best arcs of the book. Um, maybe they could have separated those out a little bit better, spread them across the season. Um, maybe it lacks a little bit of the epicness that some of the other books have, but it's so well written, so consistent, that it is just a solid middle book of Avatar. Uh, in terms of my placements, as I said, Book One Water is probably my third of the three books. I'd say book two, Earth, is definitely the second placed, which means that obviously next week's uh, episode, book three, Fire, is my top placed book. But uh, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, in the comments below, let me know what your thoughts were on book two, Earth, uh, and any thoughts on what I've said in this video. But uh, yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching, and bye.